the air force missile test center has a responsibility not only for flight testing guided missiles and training guided missile organizations but it also has the important responsibility of informing its personnel about the many activities that make up this missile test center now i am certain that the film which you are about to see will give you a much clearer understanding of our mission the benefits that you will derive from it will be a step forward in the progress of the Air Force Missile Test Center. Guided missile number 547 has just been launched. Launched by Air Force personnel of the Air Force Missile Test Center at Cocoa, Florida. Another missile is on its way downrange. In a relatively short time, this missile will hit its predetermined target many miles away from its launching point at Cape Canaveral. But launching missiles is not as easy as it appears. More than six years ago, officials of the Air Force contracted with the Glen L. Martin Company in Baltimore, Maryland to develop and build a specific guided missile. The Air Force required that the missile be self-propelled at subsonic speeds and be guided by remote control ground stations. It had to reach a target within a span of minutes. This feat has been accomplished through the engineering and research facilities of the Glen L. Martin Company and through the tireless efforts of Air Force personnel at the Air Force Missile Test Center, who constantly check and recheck each function of the missile, constantly test improvements in design and guidance, gaining valuable experience by flight testing the Matador. When and if the time occurs, this guided missile will then be ready to be used as a tactical weapon against the enemy. To flight test a missile requires trained personnel, coordination from each and every man and woman military and civilian working together for one purpose. Under command of Major General William L. Richardson and with a personnel staff of 5,000, the Air Force Missile Test Center has the responsibility to operate, maintain, and support a long-range proving ground for the flight testing of guided missiles. After the Matador missile leaves the plant in Baltimore, it arrives on a railroad flat car at Melbourne, Florida. It is then carefully transported to Patrick Air Force Base. Here the missile is assembled and checked for proper weight and balance, and a complete preliminary checkout is made of the various operating functions. The propulsive force for driving the missile is a turbojet engine. 
With some modifications, this engine is similar to the one used in F-80 aircraft. In addition to thrust, the engine provides shaft power to drive a generator, a pump for hydraulic energy for missile control, and a sequence timer. Before the launching of the missile is scheduled, a thorough atmospheric study of the entire range area is furnished by the 6th Weather Squadron. Finally, after extensive planning and coordination by engineers, project and operations officers, the launching day has been selected. The tempo of activity increases. More checking, more rehearsing. For each part of the missile and each man must perform perfectly that the missile can be launched on the scheduled hour. In the early hours of the morning, the launching crew gathers for last minute instructions. The missile is mounted on a mobile launcher and transportation for supplementary equipment, as well as its operating personnel, is ready to leave for the trip to the launching area at Cape Canaveral. Cape Canaveral was selected as the launching area for a long range proving ground because of its geographic location. For 1,500 miles, the range extends in a southeasterly direction without crossing any large land masses. Observation and data collecting stations are being built and activated at Grand Bahamas, Eleuthera, San Salvador, Mayaguana, Grand Turks Island, Dominican Republic, and Puerto Rico. The range can be extended 10,000 miles over the South Atlantic Ocean. While the convoy proceeds on its journey to the launching area, activity also starts early in the morning at the observation stations at Cape Canaveral, Jupiter, and Grand Bahamas. These stations are manned by qualified Air Force Missile Test Center personnel. Their mission is important. They are responsible for the furnishing of valuable data concerning the missile's internal performance. To exercise control and guidance, of the missile's flight as it passes high overhead through the area of each station. Manned also by trained personnel are various types of cameras which photograph the launching characteristics. Clark cameras are set up 90 degrees to the flight path to record accelerations of the missile at takeoff for the first two and one half seconds. Directly behind the missile, parallel to the flight path, Mitchell motion picture cameras make a film record of the azimuth deflection at takeoff. Offshore at the target area, technicians track the missile on its downward path with cine theatolites, visually recording external performance data at the target impact point. In the meantime, the convoy has arrived at the launching area and the missile has been pulled into position on the launching pad. This mobile zero-length launcher is used as a final assembly and checkout vehicle, as well as an actual launcher. All auxiliary equipment is mounted beneath the deck plate and is controlled by a master panel on the side of the launcher. For tactical use, it has self-contained power for operating the hydraulic system, hoisting equipment for wing insertion, air cooling for the missile's internal equipment, and power for pre-launch checkout and starting of the jet engine. All necessary equipment is controlled through cables connected to a control panel at the launching control trailer. Launching acceleration is accomplished by a rocket JATO booster. The booster unit is mounted by a movable cart beneath the fuselage tail and is rolled into position and adjusted for alignment along the exact center of gravity. During launching, the rocket thrust shears a pin and at the end of burning, ejects the spent JATO bottle. Men are working side by side. Coordination is the theme. For every function of the missile must be checked again in its correct sequence. Failure of one part to check out properly would mean a serious delay in the scheduled launching time. The crew is checking the telemetering device. In a flight test such as this, telemetering and command radio equipment are installed in place of a warhead. The main purpose for a test flight is to gain knowledge of the missile's performance. The function of the telemetering equipment 
is extremely important in obtaining this knowledge. The telemetering consists of a small radio transmitter mounted inside the missile, which monitors the performance of the missile in flight. A great many different measurements can be transmitted at one time. Important items such as altitude, airspeed, engine RPM, gyro position, functions of control, guidance and terminal dive systems are simultaneously transmitted to ground stations. Here at the ground station, these measurements are converted into voltage readings. Oscillograph and Ampex tape recorders make a permanent record of the missile's internal performance. This information is put through a data reduction system which converts this data into a form usable by missile contractors. The flight performance films obtained from the Clark cameras at the launching pad and the film from the theatolites at the impact area are sent to a central point. Film readers edit the film and transcribe these measurements. Calculators then prepare the figures for the flexo writer, which punches out a coded tape. This tape is teletyped to the National Bureau of Standards in Washington, D.C., and is run through an automatic sequence electronic computer. It is then teletyped back to Patrick Air Force Base and converted on a flexo-writer tape. The data is further reconverted into charts and tabulated numbers. Engineers evaluate and analyze these samples of data so that the relationship of one occurrence against the other may be known. This aids them in making corrections in design and launching procedures for future missiles. This is a primary function of the Air Force Missile Test Center. An intensive sea and air search is made for ships within the possible danger area hours before launching to ensure the safety of private interests. Radar stations track the ships and relay their positions to aircraft equipped with loudspeakers, which are used to warn the ships out of the area. Speedy crash ships operated by Air Force personnel also patrol the waters off the Cape and in the target zone. They head off small fishing craft who may be in the danger zone. The position and course of all ships in the area are recorded on the range clearance officer's plotting board. The in-flight safety officer relies on the accuracy of the men operating the SCR-584 radars. These men track the missile as it flies over each of the station areas. The electrical impulses are converted to the plotting board which keeps the in-flight safety officer constantly aware of the speed, location, and course of the missile. As a safety precaution, if the missile is deviating from its predetermined course or performing erratically, each in-flight safety officer can order a radio signal to be transmitted to the missile's destructor radio. This will cause the missile to destroy itself and fall harmlessly into the sea. Back on the launching pad, Air Force personnel continue checking out the missile. The guidance equipment is being checked through an opening in the left side of the fuselage below the wing. By the aid of signals generated from ground stations and command radio control, guidance steering signals are applied to an airplane type autopilot system which controls steering by means of a rudder. This system causes the missile to seek and follow a required track. It is necessary that the radio frequency bands be clear of outside interference to allow that range electronic equipment operate normally. This is the responsibility of the interference control branch which detects, locates, and analyzes any electromagnetic radiations developing in the channels assigned for missile operations. Checkout on the missile is progressing rapidly. The wing is now being installed. Great care must be taken not to damage the wing or disturb the control system. 
Firemen who have been standing by during the entire checking now pull into a closer position. Guards tighten up their roadblocks. Last minute instructions are coming through fast over the telephone net. The launching officer orders the missile to be raised to its launching position for time is getting close. It is now 15 minutes before launching time. The Sabre jet lines up for takeoff. As an additional safety precaution, a command radio system was installed in the F-86 chase plane. This permits the pilot to monitor and override the functions of the control system as it follows the missile downrange. In the meantime, the searching aircraft and crash boats have reported to the range clearance officer that they have warned all ships within the range area. All stations have reported OK to launch. Launching now calls for perfect coordination by men and machinery. The range is clear. All personnel are ready. All functions of the missile have been checked and rechecked. The missile is ready to be launched by remote control from the blockhouse. The jet engine in the missile is started. Nerves become tense as the noise becomes louder and reaches a higher pitch. been successfully launched, and as the Matador speeds down its course, we realize that this is only the beginning. We wonder what the future will bring. Will missiles be larger and more powerful, travel at supersonic speeds, be guided for more distant destinations? Whatever the achievement, it will be through the efforts of men, trained men. For we know it is mandatory that we gain and maintain supremacy in this new and important weapon, the guided missile.